Welcome to another edition of Rim Shots with Sean Barkey, brought to you by Barstools and Band Talk. I've got a really, really cool guest here today. Um, and this man, I texted him. He got back to me within probably 30 minutes. The one, the only, Mr. James Kotak. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Sean. How you been, man? I'm doing good. So you had a good Christmas. You're, uh, you're coming to us from Louisville, Kentucky? Yeah, I came over here actually the end of... Uh, um the end, or the very end of October, and I was just coming to chill out and hang out with my brother and sister, and uh, I was going to stay for like a couple of weeks, but I tripped and fell and really jacked my uh, left hip up. I couldn't believe it. I've never broken anything in my life, and uh, so I ended up, you know, going to the hospital, and I ended up staying in the hospital like five, six days, so after that, I came over here to my sister's house, and I've been here since, and I've really been enjoying it. But I've been back to the doctor like three, four times, and they're like, you know, it's probably not a good idea to travel. I'm like, oh, okay. So um, I've just been here and go, been going back to my appointments, and I had one yesterday, and things are on the up and up. Well, so uh, I want I was I was thinking about you know what I was going to ask you and and I was geez I'm I'm going back two or three years ago I found an old article in mod I think it was Modern Drummer and you had talked about growing up in Louisville Kentucky and uh, the story goes a little something like you were playing a bar or maybe a hotel or something and somebody from I, I think it was maybe Bobby Blotzer saw you and said you got to get out of here and get to Los Angeles do you remember that interview? Well, and, you know, uh, I, I started this podcast at a pure boredom because everything was shut down and I couldn't, you know, I'm a drummer myself, couldn't play, I wasn't doing any shows, so I was like, hey, I'll do what everybody else is doing, I'll do a podcast. Recurring sort of theme with me is I meet folks such as yourself, it's uh, it's great when you meet some of your heroes and, and they're not assholes. Is, right. uh, is that a fair statement? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I've been very fortunate to meet, you know, um, I could name a drummer, you know, and I got to meet them, but, you know, also I got to meet so many great other artists. Uh, I think the only person I've ever been starstruck from is I, I was went to the Rainbow in L.A., and, the, you know, the Rainbow is a famous pizza joint, basically, that's what it is. And uh, I was sitting at the back table, and this was like 6 in the afternoon, and over to my left at the other table was James Brown. I was like, going, oh, my God. So... I waited about 45 minutes. He got done eating. I, I asked his bodyguard, dude, I go, can I meet him? And I met James Brown. So other than that, I mean, there's tons of people I've been thrilled to meet uh, over the years. And uh, he's, but James Brown stands out just because he's James Brown. <laughs> and, uh, but drummer-wise, man, I've been really lucky to meet just about everybody. So when you were coming up, and I guess, you know, back to back to being from Louisville again, and I, I guess you get to a point where, you know, people are recognizing you or noticing you, you know, you, you become the, the big fish in the little pond, and I'm going to guess that that kind of was what happened for you. Um, who were some of those folks that, you know, uh, maybe emulated or looked up to that, uh, you know, you were listening to to kind of hone your chops? Well, obviously, in the late 70s, I was all about Neil Peart and Rush, and, you know, they, you know, it was... Rush was kind of like an underground band until 2112 came along and you know me and my friends knew who they were and, and we went and saw them live and stuff and God, I saw Rush open up for like uh, God, I can't even remember now but I, they were the opening band go figure that and uh, you know of course I was a Led Zeppelin guy I grew I had you know in my house we had like a box of like 12 track takes and one of them was Led Zeppelin 4 
and House of the Holy and then a, a few James Brown uh, things. And it just, I was just about anybody who was like, uh, John Bonham or anybody like that. And they were just my heroes. And I just, I just spent hours playing over and over and over to eight track tapes. And uh, that's how I learned how to play drums. And then still to this day, it's like, you know, that that was the best education ever. Um. So you said you're laid up, you got you got a hip injury and stuff. But uh, you know, I guess where you are in your life and in your career and stuff, do do you still spend a lot of time woodshedding, or do you just kind of do it when it kind of strikes you? You know, you're bored or you have an idea, or how, how do you approach that, James? Well, um, I, I don't actually have a drum set set up at home. I do have an electronic kit, um, but like, so Kingdom Come will go out to do some shows, or even back with with Scorpions. You know, I would like go to a rehearsal room where they have drums in, in LA they have all these rehearsal places where drums are already set up so I would just go over there and uh, rehearse with Kingdom Come or you know whatever because I, I don't necessarily like to just go and bang out a bunch of drums by myself I like to play with you know music and songs and stuff and um, so that's basically what goes on like Kingdom Come we have a show coming up in early February so we'll get in there and we'll we'll mess around for a couple days and then we go play the gig. So it's still, you know, kind of like riding the bicycle thing. Yep. But you still, I have to, you know, stay in shape. And fortunately, I enjoy walking like crazy. And, um, I, you know, staying in shape. You know, when I say walking like crazy, I mean, I'll, I'll get out and do like a mile and a half and um, about five days a week. And that keeps me going. But, you know, there's nothing like you have to play drums. And I, I always have a pair of sticks on my coffee table or somewhere where I'm always messing around with them to keep limber. So, you know, and it's funny, right? Because, um, you know, you mentioned learning the craft and, and you know, and, and playing the tapes. And now it's just so like, you know, if I see one more six-year-old playing Tom Sawyer note for note, I'm going to scream, you know what I mean? <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. I was good. I, I, no, go ahead. Yeah, so... <laughs> You know, and I, I, I don't want to, I guess, take up too much sort of nostalgic uh, stuff, but when you got out to L.A., how quickly was it of a transition for you of, um, you know, gigging versus, I guess, networking and trying to get your name out there? Well, I, when I went to L.A., uh, a friend of mine's band from Louisville had moved out there about a year or so earlier, and they um, they had a bit of success with some one of those TV competition shows, and then they were playing in, in bars like six nights a week. And I knew them from here. So they go, hey, our drummer's leaving. I, I don't know how I ended up talking to him because I thought about moving to L.A. many times. And they're like, oh, well, why don't you come out and you can play with us? I'm like, well, okay. So I got out there and like about seven days later, we started playing, you know, uh, the circuit that they were on. And you spent, like I said, six nights a week, five sets a night. And But immediately, right when I got there, I started asking around, where do you go to meet guys in rock bands? Because I was like, in the back of my head, I go, okay, I know I, I need to be with a band on a record level. So that's when I first went to the Rainbow. I met uh, a few different, quote, rock stars and guys in the business. And, um, you know, I, there was a, a, a couple of people who had, like, these networking things where they set you up to go on auditions. Because at the time, it was just a flood of, you know, drummers and everybody trying to get gigs. So I went on this audition, and it happened to be with Lenny, um, and that became Kingdom Come. So and so I spent about five months playing in the bars, and then I transitioned into doing that. And we just started pre-production, and you know, six months later, went and did the first Kingdom Come album, and that's it. I never looked back. <laughs> I you know it's it's funny. I remember I remember like exactly when that album hit because. Um, you know, for me, I, I was actually a, a, a Lenny fan beforehand with his previous band, and then when he came out with, with Kingdom Come, I was right. like, whoa. Um, but, you know, like, the press kind of uh, kind of did this up one comparison, which is kind of like, if you if you play anything side by side, you're going to be able to, you know, uh, nick and, 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 and grab influences. Did you guys kind of get annoyed with that, or did you just kind of wear it and just say, hey, what the heck, it's giving us press, we're going to take it? I personally was, like, proud of it. 
of it. I'm like, if you're going to be compared to somebody, be compared to the very best. Uh, our singer was was extremely annoyed, and he we lost a lot of uh, ground because of his responses to a lot of the press. But I, you know, it never bothered me one bit. A couple of the guys were like, "Oh, hey man, whatever." And um, um, you know, we were out there, and, and still, you have to remember the time. Is this is early '80s, or uh, I'm sorry, late '80s. And Led Zeppelin was still a really prominent band. And then also along comes White Snake and this one and that. And they started comparing everybody to Led Zeppelin. But it never bothered me one bit. And like I'm like, oh, wow, cool, I'll take it. Well, and I mean, that album just exploded and then the second one did great too and i mean you know you guys had a had a good run now you, you've, you've got the band back together so to speak and um i i like to ask people that kind of had success during the time that you did why do you think that that music kind of has had such a resurgence the last say eight to ten years where it was kind of you know everybody seattle breaks and you know the hair the hair mu- metal music which i absolutely love is like kind of cast aside but now it just seems to be Bigger and better than ever. Why, why do you feel that that, that is? I, I don't know, but you're right. The 90s were terrible for hard rock. And um, um, I, and it, it, I, I don't know. It, you know, once the grunge thing came along, everybody was, uh, every label went and found everybody, anything from, you know, from Oregon and Washington. And it was just a phase, like, because music goes in phases. And then, you know, in the 90s, I, got, I joined Scorpions, and that was an excellent experience. I ended up staying there for 21 years, which is, I mean, in rock and roll, that's an eternity. Yeah, that's and, two uh, lifetimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It's like, may as well be 150 years in real life. And I went, uh, you know, uh, I kind of got off track here. But it was, uh, I, 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 I don't know, it's just that music... Like Scorpions is still around. I mean, Scorpions have been going. I think this is their fiftieth anniversary this year, and it's just classic killer hard rock, and it never goes away. You know, same with like you know, Metallic is kind of in that department now, and there's just so much great music that that just won't go away. And King and Come, we kind of fell in that category there for a bit, and then you know things come and go, and then we were not the most liked band. But then here we are now, after Scorpions, uh, I left Scorpions around 2017, uh, for about a year and a half, and I go, okay, now it's time to do something, because Scorpions works. I mean, we, every year we were out there, we had maybe one year where we only played like 15 shows, so I was pretty tired, <laughs> I could tell you the truth, and I look forward to just being home having a regular life. So, uh, but then I go, okay, time for Kingdom Come again, because, you know, I really... Ch- things and put the word out hey man if there's anything and you know i got a few calls about this and that and i played on a couple albums but it was nothing that really got me going i go king of god why not i love the music and uh, unfortunately lenny i've been talking to lenny about redoing king of gum since like 2008 2010 and unfortunately he said yes the whole time and then at the last minute he goes you know what i changed my mind i decided i don't want to do it so me and rick steyer you know, we'd already delved into it, so we ended up getting a different singer, and that was Keith St. John, and went and played some shows, and it all kind of worked out, and so here we are. Yeah, I think it's great, and I mean, you you see the you know the the Monsters of Rock cruises, and you see like the festivals that take place, and. Um... All the bands that I grew up listening to and loving are out there playing, and I just think it's it's really um, you know I've got a friend that has a theory that uh, the music is popular because a lot of the kids today their parents grew up on this music and they got to hear it when they were younger. Exactly, and uh, that's a big big part of it because uh, everybody who was my age and I'm not sure how old you are, uh, and, uh, but you know I can relate to that because. Um, it's just stayed with us, and you know, a lot of kids are, are up and on this. And you know, I, I I talk privately quite a bit, and in the last years I have, and a lot of these uh, kids I'm teaching, they're like, you know, 10, 12, 18, whatever, and they're really, oh, will you teach me how to play Ozzy Crazy Train? I'm like, oh, okay. And they're really not much on the new stuff. Yeah. So it's funny how that goes. It is. And uh, yeah. So, um, what, what, I, I had a friend the other day who, uh, and he was kind of doing something on, on a local level out here and he got a, uh, he got some, 
what he was doing was actually very good, but he got some bad feedback from a couple of people, and he was devastated. Um, this day and age of internet, and everybody's out there. Band? Pardon me. His original band. Yeah, he he had written a, he had written some stuff, and it was it was basically two or three people had kind of trashed it, and um, he was he was very very upset, and you know, and in this day and age, I know like I played New Year's Eve, and everybody's out with a camera and good bad or whatever. Um, you know, I I basically told him shake it off, but you know, when you're at the level where you you are and where you, you know, how, how do you, how do you deal with that negative stuff? Like, cause you know, obviously somebody taking a shot is, is, is crappy, but you got to do it probably repeatedly. Um, how, how do you, how, how do you get to the point or what would you tell somebody that's going through that? You know what? It's most of these people are, are, they're journalists, they're critics, they're whatever. You have to remember they're all, they all started out probably as musicians, as a frustrated musicians, yeah. and they, you know, that's a big part of their, they take it out on successful people like your friend or like myself or whatever. And you, for me, I just kind of like go, okay, cool, that's your opinion. You don't like this and you don't like that or whatever. And I kind of learned that early on with Kingdom Come uh, to just kind of like, oh, well, let it go. And I, I kind of kept that same... I, Five. Even before I moved to LA, I had a band here based out of uh, Louisville around the '84, uh, around that time, and we played regionally. And you know, I had a couple albums out. We did it on our own. And you know, there's always somebody from the local whatever rock magazine or whatever local scene or whatever you want to call it. You know, they always wanted to put the, the whoever was up and coming down, and you just. Just kind of like, okay, cool, whatever. Yeah, I remember I've been in bands where it really bothers a lot of the guys. I'm like, man, dude, just remember, they're just frustrated freaks and they don't know what else to do. Yeah. So, and most of the guys writing this stuff, they're just part-time guys, man. They have a full-time job and then they write on the side. So, not all of them, because there's some really, really quality killer, you know, journalists out there. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I played a... I, I have a band here, and I, our, our very first show, we were playing a club, and it was packed, and a friend of mine, like five minutes before, comes up, and he goes, man, there's ten drummers in the audience, are you nervous? All I could think of was, I got their ten bucks, they can leave any time they want. I, I honestly didn't care, right? <laughs> That's a great answer. I wish I would have had that one 50 years ago. Or well, not 50 years ago, but yeah, that's a really good answer. I, you know what? That never bothered me. I never really paid much attention there. So like, going, oh, well, this one's in the audience and that one. You know, especially even later. I mean, there was times on the Monsters of Rock tour, which was a great tour. Kingdom Come, we opened, and Metallica, Doc and um, Scorpions, and Van Halen. It was a stadium tour. We did like 30-something dates. And there was several times when we went on first, and you look over to the side, there's James Hetfield. Yeah. Look over to the side, there's Sammy Hager, because they'd come to check the bands out. And uh, I was just like, kind of like, okay, cool. What I'm, I'm doing here is I'm playing for the 20,000 or however many people in front of me. That's all that matters to me. Yeah, I think, I think if you really want to do music well anything but a music in general i think your first gut check is is being able to play in front of your peers and not really caring that's just my opinion but right so yeah you uh so uh, at some point in time you're going to make your way back to the west coast but uh what what's what's mr kotak doing in in his uh with his time these days um obviously kingdom comes going back out but is, is there anything else on the go that you uh that you have well, like I said, one of my uh, endless uh, tasks is staying in shape and, you know, exercising and that sort of thing. Right now, I'm just doing a lot of stretching and walk. I'm just now able to, like, you know, walk about, you know, probably do about 800 steps a day. And that may sound like a lot, but I'm normally used to doing a whole lot more. And um, so I'm here in Louisville, like I said, I'm just really laying low and enjoying the time over here at my sister's house and my brother's hanging out. And then I've, I've got all kinds of friends here. But like I said, I said uh, it's been really kind of quiet here. But once I get back to L.A., you know, there's things planned and, you know, there's always something popping up. That's the cool thing about the uh, rock and roll music business, whatever. Now we're past the new year. You know, somebody will call about this or that. And then we're also planning, uh, you know, Kingdom Come shows and stuff because, man, that COVID thing came. And for the year 2020, 
being is, oh, we had like about 40, 45 shows booked. Um, and everything got wiped out, man, even the, the European stuff, because we were going to Germany and all over the place, and uh, even Japan. Everything, because of that COVID thing, got, got totally postponed. And a lot of the stuff that was postponed to 2021 and even 2022 never happened, because a lot of the places shut down, a lot of promoters went out of business. It really hurt lots of people. So we're just kind of picking up now where we left off and talk to our agent and try to book some shows. Yeah, well, and I think that's great, man, because, I mean... Um... Thanks. Like, well, and, and, and you're a guy that, um, you know, I, I don't want to sound, uh, I always joke around when I'm interviewing somebody, I don't want to be like Chris Farley when he was on Saturday Night Live with Paul McCartney, right? But you, you are a guy that I've followed for, yeah, yeah, but you are a guy that I've followed a very long time, I obviously know your career, you're working the Scorpions, I mean, some of the solos that, you know, people would send me, hey, did you see this, and you'd be doing this crazy double kick you know, like, and it was just like, wow, not something that I would have known you for, but there's chops that people don't get to see that you have that, you know, you got to go dig deep. Well, man, well, uh, thank you very much. I take that as a, a compliment. And, you know, uh, yeah, because Kingdom Come is kind of what put me on the map. And I've always had a single kick in that setup, but I always had a double pedal, of course. Yeah. But the double bass thing goes back to when I was playing in clubs and stuff and uh, like 83, 84, 85 in my metal band, you know, we were playing our own stuff, but then in order to make money, you know, you have to go out and play, we play cover songs, everything from Fast as a Shark, from Accept to uh, just tons of double bass stuff, and that really got my chops on on Mark. But then, you know, you go along and, you know, Kingdom Come, I didn't need it, and it was it was different, but then Scorpions, you needed it a little bit, and then when it's solo time, you can just go nuts and do anything you want, as long as the crowd likes it. And um, so it's one of those things well, what do I, you know, I've heard drummers say, well, I don't need double bass because the band I'm in, well, you don't, it doesn't need it. But you don't know what's going to happen, you know, two bands from now or three bands from now. So it's good to, to like, learn and know everything across the board, you know. And um, I don't care if it's just learning, you know, stuff from a uh, marching band so you know how to play a, a, a cadence on the snare drum or whatever it is. So... That's always been my theory, and it seemed to have worked a little bit. And uh, with, with teaching and stuff, you know, a lot of drummers would come in, and, you know, they've been playing for a couple of years, and they uh, want to just start it, whatever. I'd go back to the beginning, so, yeah, well, let's work on your, your hand technique and your foot technique and all that stuff. And then move on to the, uh, you know, double bass, you know, 10 yeah. lessons later. Well, it's funny, I was having this... I was having this conversation last night with uh, with somebody, and we didn't have a lot of drum line up here. Like, so you know, you guys see the college, you know, the college football games down there, and you get this m amazing drum line where people are spinning sticks and doing tricks, and we never had that up here. And uh, so as a as a result, you know, we we see some guys like you know yourself and, and guys that were spinning sticks and whatnot, and it's like, whoa, you know, where does that come from? Were you involved in, in that type of drumming? about third grade all the way up to college I played trumpet and I played trumpet in the marching band in high school I never was in the my band director wouldn't let me go join the drum section because <laughs> it, it was kind of not real happening at my high school and then uh, I went off to University of Louisville and uh, at that point though I joined the drum department for or orchestra and symphony band and then also part of my scholarship I had to be in the marching band and the pep band and all that stuff. So that was a totally different story. So that was the first time I was in drumline. And, uh, but I, I was I was actually on second bass drum out of five, which was really difficult. Everybody underestimates the bass drum thing, but this was like going very, very difficult if you ever watch these drum lines. And you know, we had probably about 30 in our drum line. But uh, the drumstick twirling thing came from, you know, there's so much time hanging around you know, when you're on break at a bar, you're you're on break at rehearsal, and I just always sat around twirling sticks. I don't know. Yeah. And it just stayed with me, and um, especially playing in bars, man, I had to do something to spruce things up because it got boring. It gets boring really fast. No, for sure, for sure. Look, I I, I, I promise I'd be respectful of your time. I also promise that we wouldn't do anything salacious. I I really appreciate you doing this. It's been great to meet you, sir. Um, 
you know, hopefully your uh, your hip gets better really quick. Um, and uh, yeah, again, thanks so much. Man, dude, thanks so much. And yes, thank you. My my hip, I'm doing great. I mean, another two weeks, I'll be like, you know, almost back to normal. And that's about what they said. They go, look, give it four to six weeks. I'm like, oh no, or, 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 or I'm sorry, three to six weeks. I go, no, I'll be good after two months. I'm, I'm three to six months. Jesus Christ! It affected my brain apparently too. <laughs> so um, uh, you know, I'm, I'll be up and running here in no time. And uh, this is probably the worst accident I've ever had. And I just tripped and fell on the, on the pavement. It was like, and I didn't feel like anything bad happened. But anyway, uh, I'm up and running, and things are good. And uh, Sean, I appreciate your time. And uh, here's a rim shot. There you go. Thanks again, sir. And you have a great day. Hi, right, man. Thanks for that. Hey, and uh, you know, send me the link so I can post it on my Twitter and Facebook and all that jazz. Absolutely, James Kodak, kids. Hi, right, man.